The adult human brain weighs approximately one and a half kilograms, making up less than 2% of a person's body weight. And yet, it defines our humanity and makes us the individuals that we are. The brain is responsible for the generation of language and thought, attention, consciousness, memory, and imagination. In order to fit into the skull and accommodate the massive number of neurons and connections needed, the brain is highly folded. This results in the creation of gyri or ridges and sulci or furrows. If we were to unfold the entire human brain, it would take up approximately one square meter. Perhaps the most impressive feature of the brain is the amount of connections formed between neurons. There are an estimated 86 billion neurons in the brain, each of which forms an average of 7,000 connections with other neurons, resulting in between 100 and 500 trillion synapses within the brain. In an attempt to conceive of the enormity of this system, the number of neurons in the human brain has been equated to the number of stars in the Milky Way. Now that we have begun to appreciate the complexity of the human brain, let's begin to examine its structure. The brain can be divided into functional and anatomical regions. We will now start with an anatomical overview to establish a common terminology and to describe the areas of the brain. The brain has multiple surfaces. Here we have the superior surface, and this here is the inferior surface. There are also anterior and posterior aspects to the brain. Here's a section through the brain within the skull and we can appreciate the axes within the CNS. Connections can travel either towards the anterior pole, here, or towards the inferior end of the spinal cord. Fibers can move either rostrally, towards the rostral pole, or caudally, towards the caudal pole. Now, let's look at these component parts of the brain. This is the forebrain, which is composed of the cerebral hemispheres and deep structures. The right and left hemispheres are roughly symmetrical and are connected through corpus callosum, which you can see here. Here, we have cut the brain in half, separating the two hemispheres from each other. This is the cut surface of corpus callosum, the largest white matter tract in the brain. Impressively, it consists of an estimated 200 to 250 million projections. This structure here is the thalamus. And together with the hypothalamus here and the subthalamus, which you cannot see, it makes up the diencephalon. The cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon together comprise the forebrain. We now move into the brainstem which is caudal to the diencephalon. The brainstem can be divided into three parts. The midbrain, located here just caudal to the thalamus, contains the large fiber bundles, the cerebral peduncles, that connect the forebrain with all caudal structures. The pons is located caudal to the midbrain. It is connected to the cerebellum through the cerebellar peduncles. The most caudal part of the brainstem is the medulla. It is continuous with the spinal cord as it exits through foramen magnum of the skull. The cerebellum is embryologically part of the pons, but its functions are so distinct that it is now considered its own entity, separate from the brainstem. The cerebral hemispheres can be divided into lobes along some key surface landmarks. The central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The lateral fissure separates the temporal lobe from both the frontal and parietal lobes. The occipital lobe 
is separated from the parietal lobe via the parietal occipital sulcus, which you can see on this medial aspect of the brain. You can draw a line onto the lateral surface right here to differentiate between the occipital lobe and the parietal and temporal lobes. In this medial view of the brain, you can identify a continuous strip of cortex which swings around the surface of the brain. This lobe has been dubbed the limbic lobe due to its intimate relationship with the limbic system. It spans the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. Deep within the brain are spaces filled with cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. This is a 3D reconstruction of the ventricular system. You can see the two C-shaped lateral ventricles in the cerebral hemispheres. They have an anterior horn deep within the frontal and parietal lobes of the forebrain, a posterior horn which extends into the occipital lobe, and an inferior horn which extends into the temporal lobe. These lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle in the midline. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. On this mid-sagittal section of the brain, we can identify different components of the ventricular system. This here is the lateral ventricle. The anterior horn will extend anteriorly here into the frontal lobe, and the posterior horn will extend into the occipital lobe. This here is the third ventricle. The thalamus is on either side of the third ventricle. The third ventricle connects to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, right here. This here is the fourth ventricle at the level of the pons and medulla. The fourth ventricle is going to close off into the central canal. Let's look at the various planes a brain can be sectioned in. This is a very important concept because imaging of the brain uses these planes. I'm going to cut this brain in the coronal plane. So you can now see corpus callosum here, and we've started to look into the ventricular system. So this is the anterior tip of the anterior horn here. So this next slice will take us into the anterior pole of the temporal lobe right here. And those pieces might fall off because they're not connected to the plane that I'm cutting in. There we go, so let's have a look at that. All right, so what you can see on this slide is really the um, lateral ventricle again. We've got the head of the caudate nucleus right there and the putamen. And here, this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule. All right, so in this section now, you can see the two lateral ventricles, as well as the third ventricle here on either side of the thalamus. All right, so here in this section now, you can again see the two lateral ventricles. Here we're going into the cerebral aqueduct on our way to the fourth ventricle. And this here is the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Okay. So in this section here, again, here are the two lateral ventricles. Here again is the inferior horn, the hippocampus, right there in the floor of the inferior horn. All of this here is the thalamus. We're quite posterior now, as you can tell in the brain. So all of this is thalamus here. And we're actually getting into the posterior parts of the thalamus there. <laughs> 
right here, we are in the midbrain and the pond. So it's a bit of an oblique section here through the brainstem, but you can see the cerebral aqueduct here. And of course, this is the pond. All right, so in this section here, you can see that we're now getting into the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. This is the very, very tail end of corpus callosum there. You can see the cut surface here of the cerebellum. It's the middle cerebellar peduncle moving in there. And here you can see the central canal. It's gonna open up into the fourth ventricle, which will lie just on the other side of that opening there. In this coronal section, we can see both gray and white matter. White matter is the sum of all myelinated axons or tracts as they travel through the CNS. Gray matter is the sum of all nerve cell bodies. It can be seen here along this cortical band on the surface of the brain, which is why an increased surface area is so important to accommodate the large number of neurons in the cortex. Gray matter can also be found in these deep nuclei of the forebrain, including basal ganglia and limbic structures. We're going to cut this brain in a horizontal orientation. Okay, we're now going to cut through the brainstem here in an axial orientation. So here's the midbrain. And here we've cut through the pons in the superior cerebellar peduncle as it projects to the cerebellum. So this is the last section here through the pons, and you can see some of the deep cerebellar nuclei here. In this cut here, you can see the inferior part of the cerebellum and then part of the open medulla. And here, you can see the closed medulla as the ventricle has closed over the central canal here. Finally, the brain can be cut along the sagittal plane. Here, we have cut the brain along the mid-sagittal plane to separate the two hemispheres. With this overview, we now have a common terminology as we begin our journey through the brain. Okay, so my name is David Cox, and I'm a professor of biology and computer science at Harvard.
And I'm going to tell you today about an exciting new frontier at the intersection of neuroscience and computer science. And part of what's exciting about this is that neuroscience and computer science are two of the fastest moving fields uh, that we have today. And for many of you, when you think about neuroscience, you might, the first thing that comes to mind might be medicine and health. But I'm going to argue, I'm going to try and convince you that actually neuroscience uh, is much bigger than that and that the stakes are much larger. So science is about understanding the world around us, but it's also about understanding where we fit into that world. And it's human nature to look at ourselves and try and understand how we fit in, and, and more than just how we fit in, how we're special. And there are, there are many things that we could think about being special uh, that are different about humans from the rest of the world. And we might even be tempted to think that we're some sort of pinnacle of evolution. But it turns out that biology teaches us otherwise. We're just one out of millions of species on this planet, each of which is exquisitely adapted to its niche. We're not the most numerous species. We're not the largest. We're not the fastest or the strongest. We're not the longest lived. We're not the most resilient. So what, if anything, makes us special? Arguably, the thing that makes us unique is our complexity. But not complexity in some generic sense. Nature is rife with complexity. What makes us special is the complexity of our brains. We, more than any other species, can learn and adapt and shape our environments, pass on culture, and we've spread to every corner of the planet and even beyond it. Every work of art, every edifice of our civilization, it's born of activity in our brains and born of the complexity of our minds. And meanwhile, we're slaves to that complexity. If, if that complexity strays even just a little bit, we can collapse underneath it and have mental disorders and disease. And um, at the same time, all of the great things that our, uh, that our complexity is able to produce also produces all the bad things uh, that, that are facing us today. So, I would argue that understanding the brain is tantamount to understanding who we are. And I think we should all be interested in neuroscience. Um, I may be biased. Um, and we've been thinking about it for a long time. So what is it about the brain? What is it about this complexity? Uh, how does it work? And uh, interestingly, when we look out into the world, oftentimes we look at it through our, the lens of our own technology of our day. So in the 17th century, Descartes, a great philosopher and mathematician, uh, thought about the brain in terms of the technology of the day, which was hydraulic technology. So he believed that the seat of the soul was the pituitary gland and that fluids animated our body, uh, much like, like a hydraulic system would. Fast forward to the 19th century, Sigmund Freud used the analogy of the technology of his day, the steam engine, talked about pressure being released and built up, talking about the uh, mental states of, of our minds being driven by the engines of our conscious and subconscious. And we fast forward to the 20th century, the era of radio and, and electronics, and all of a sudden we start talking about our mental processes these ways. We talk about wavelengths and crossed wires and channels. And now today, we have computers. Uh, so increasingly neuroscientists talk about circuits, and we talk about uh, brains uh, passing information and processing information. We talk about networks. As our technology advances, so too do our metaphors. And it's very easy to be led astray by our metaphors. Uh, there are many ways in which our brains are not like the computers we have on our, on our desks or in our pockets. But what's different about computer science and computers is that this, act, this metaphor is actually more than just a metaphor. Um, computer science gives us the formal tools to evaluate a computational system, a system that processes information. So even when we're, dealt, we're faced with something that has a different implementation, we can separate out what's computed, an algorithm, from how we compute it, an implementation. And this gives us tremendous power to reason about computational systems, including ourselves. So why is this important? Well, first of all, 
um, health today, mental health, uh, is, is in many ways the last frontier of neuroscience. Increasingly, we're able to treat many of the diseases and disorders that afflict humanity, but mental disorders, diseases, are in many ways the, the sort of last frontier, and part of the reason for that is that our tools that we use to treat them are relatively crude. So most of these pills, this is Prozac, are small molecules that target re, uh, molecular systems, receptors, um, that act throughout the brain and in fact throughout the body. Prozac actually also works on the heart. Um, because they have such diffuse effects, it's very hard to target their action and it's very hard to prevent off-target effects. In many ways, it would be like going to your IT department with your computer to have them fix it and all they could do was to change the silicon properties of the computer chips inside. They might be able to fix the problem some of the time, but that's not really the right uh, level of analysis, the right, the right uh, approach to fixing that problem. Instead, you really need to understand the software of the system. And if we could understand the software of the brain, then complex disorders like schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder and depression, which aren't caused by any sort of overt, obvious damage to the brain, uh, but are probably more like miswirings and, and problems in the software. And increasingly, we're starting to get to the point where we do uh, understand at a computational level some of the codes that the brain uses that we can then interface with. So on, on the left here, we have a cochlear implant, which is one of the earliest uh, sort of bionic implants. It's, it's a series of electrodes that are inserted into the cochlea of the ear, and you can restore hearing uh, in some cases. So this is a direct interface to our nervous system. On the right, we have BrainGate. So this is uh, a, a, an exciting new technology, but also at a very crude sort of uh, infancy stage. Uh, here, this woman is uh, quadriplegic, and that thing on her head is actually an electrode array that's inserting electrodes into her brain, and then those electrodes are reading activity from her motor cortex, and then using it to move an arm. So increasingly, uh, we can interface with the brain if we understand how, how it works. Now, there's an even bolder and broader set of things we can do if we can understand at a computational level how the brain works. So if we could take those codes, if we really understood how the brain works, we should be able to build it. And the, the famous physicist Richard Feynman once said, that which I do not understand, I cannot build. Or that which I cannot build, I, I do not understand. So uh, that's really the mantra of, of what my lab does. And through this lens, we're, we're basically looking and asking, can we reverse engineer the brain? Can we study the brain's wiring and circuitry so that we can build computer systems that work the same way? So the, the, the consequences of this might not be immediately obvious. So let's just take a moment to think about all the different jobs in the world. So uh, here we have some factories uh, making cars, making iPhones. We have people sweeping the street. We have people looking at poultry. A surprising fraction of the world's jobs mostly require a working visual system so we can see and understand what we're seeing and a working motor system so we can take hands and we can move them and we can manipulate our environment. But at the point at which we can recreate these abilities in computers and in robots, uh, a lot's going to change. So here are some very crude robots that are, are sort of the advanced guard in, in this new revolution. Uh, we have the iRobot Roomba, which is basically replacing uh, somebody sweeping the floor. It, it has very simple, uh, uh, simple brain in it, perhaps more like an insect than like a person. We also have these industrial robots, um, which have been around for quite a while. But what these require is a highly controlled environment where the, the robot needs to move, it needs to have the thing be where it needs to be at the moment it needs it to be there. And it's all a very highly choreographed, very highly controlled system. But increasingly, we're finding robots now that are going to break that mold. So already, we have this advanced guard of Asimo, which is a bipedal walking robot made by Honda. Uh, it doesn't have a purpose per se, other than to be a showcase for robotics. But uh, people are already starting to think about using robots like this for domestic servant kind of uh, roles. We also have this robot Baxter, uh, which is uh, from Boston, uh, startup coming out of MIT, 
And what Baxter is, is, a, is a, it's a robot with two hands that can be trained alongside a human to perform tasks. And increasingly more uh, beyond the, the industrial robots that I showed you uh, in the car factory, this system can adapt to different conditions. It has some rudimentary vision. So as we, as we imagine to uh, have an understanding of the brain and be able to build more and more complex abilities into our computers, then we're going to see a renaissance in robotics, and that's really going to change uh, just about everything about our economy. There are also jobs that aren't jobs currently. So there are a lot of things we'd like to do that, we, that hum only humans can do, um, but that we can't scale up to a scale that we need. So this is an example that's, that's literally close to home for me. Um, the Boston Marathon bombers um, planted a bomb. They were caught by many, many cameras. So the, it turns out now nearly every storefront, uh, every shop has a camera in it. Uh, people are taking pictures of the event. Um, they were documented multiple times moving around, dropping the, the bomb. But interestingly, even after the fact, when the authorities collected together all of the images, it wasn't possible to find out who they were. They had pictures of them. They, they, they had pretty much right on the spot. You can see one picture there. Um, here's another picture. Uh, and uh, this turns out that this is one of the, the bombers right here. And then lots and lots of these, these photos. But it turns out that uh, face recognition software was not useful at all in, in uh, discovering these bombers, even though we had many pictures of them. And we had pictures to match against the technology that we have currently for doing machine vision, for having computers look at images and understand them, uh, wasn't up to the task. Now, we know that humans can do this task because uh, the friends of these brothers saw these pictures online and then went and, and uh, destroyed some evidence. Uh, so they were clearly able to do it. Um, but what we weren't able to do was to deploy at scale the kind of human resources that we need. This is just something that computers can do well and, and humans can't. So if we can build human abilities into machines, then scalability becomes uh, not an issue anymore. So we want to study the brain. We want to reverse engineer it. Uh, that's an awfully big piece to bite off all at once. Uh, so it turns out the human brain has 100 billion neurons in it, and it has 100 trillion connections. So we can't just understand it all at once. So what we do and what, what many other labs do is to focus on one subsystem in particular. And for a variety of reasons, I study vision. Now, obviously, vision, for the examples I gave you, has sort of industrial relevance that's hard to argue with. But in addition, it's one of our most natural senses. We, as primates, use our vision all the time. We're very good at vision. And, and we frankly take it for, for granted. So um, if we look at an image like this one, even if you haven't seen this structure, this is close to where, uh, where I live. Uh, Instantly, without any effort, you're able to read out all kinds of information about this scene. So you can tell if this is a castle. You could tell me which way the wind is blowing. You could probably tell me how cold it was that day. Um, if I take another picture, like this camel, even if you haven't been to the Gobi Desert and you've never seen a camel like this before, you instantly recognize that this is a camel. You could probably tell me what it would sound like to walk on the ground on, uh, on, in the scene. So all of that you got instantly from the image, and you didn't have to exert any effort. And one of the things that, that's, that's uh, frustrating, frankly, about studying vision is that everyone thinks it's easy, because you just look at things and you see them. But the reason it's easy is because you have the solution to the problem in your head, and it evolved over hundreds of millions of years. So let me give you some insight on why this is actually so hard for computers to do, even if it's easy for humans to do. So for one thing, here's an object in the world that's one I care about quite a bit. This is my daughter. Uh, this is presumably the first picture you've ever seen of my daughter. Um, but if I show you another picture uh, in a slightly different pose, uh, different lighting, everyone can instantly recognize that this is the same person. This is the same thing in the world. Uh, but at a pixel level, these images have almost nothing to do with each other. The colors are different. The arrangement of pixels is different. Uh, computers have a very hard time telling those two things are the same thing. 
Uh, and we can also deal with incredibly uh, rich and complicated uh, occlusions and different views and lightings. We can instantly recognize that. And it's, it's frustrating uh, at some level to try and build computer vision systems, systems that can do what we can do, because we take it for so much for granted, and it's actually such a hard problem. So any given object in the world can cast infinitely different images on your retina. And actually, it turns out the converse is true as well. So any given image in the world can correspond to infinitely many different objects in the world. So has anyone figured out what's going on in this image? Who says magnets? Oh, no, no, no magnets today. So this is actually an illusion. And actually, many of these illusions are playing on this, this, this tricky piece about vision. So any given object can cast infinitely many different images, because we can change your view and lighting. But any given image could actually correspond to infinitely many different objects. And uh, this particular illusion was constructed to, to, uh, to take advantage of that. I mean, one interpretation of me looking out at this audience is that I'm standing inside a sphere, and you're all just painted on uh, that sphere in this particular arrangement. It's not a good interpretation of the world, but it's a valid one. It's actually, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no proof that that's not the, the answer. Uh, and this is what we call in, in science an ill-posed problem. We have a three-dimensional world outside, and we're measuring it with a two-dimensional structure. Our retina is a two-dimensional structure. So we have to make inferences. We have to be guessing about what's in the world. And our, our visual system is very good at guessing the right thing. It gets it right more often than wrong. And that's why visual illusions are so compelling, is because uh, they violate those, those usually very good assumptions. The other thing about vision is we're constantly dealing with incredibly complex and ambiguous information. So here we have a street scene. And I, I think all of you could probably make an estimate of how many people roughly are in this image. And I think we'd all agree that there are people on the other side of the street as well, right? So there's people in the foreground. We can see them somewhat clearly. There's also people in the background. If we zoom in on part of that background, uh, this is what was. This is what you were actually looking at. This is exactly the same information, just blown up a little bit. And if we cover this up, um, you were certainly able to recognize that there were people on the other side of the street, but you didn't actually have any information to to, sh to prove that or to give you that impression. The information you used to know that there were people on the other side of the street was the context. You were able to integrate a model of knowing about how street scenes work, knowing how people, where they should be, where the heads would be, and you're able to infer a lot of things, and perhaps even uh, to the level of almost hallucinating the, imp the impression that there were these, these, uh, these faces, even though you couldn't see them. There wasn't actually any real information. So this, these are amazing abilities that we don't yet know how to build into computers. So how do, what do we know, though, about biology? So, if we take an image in the world, the photons are projected onto the retina, which is a two-dimensional layer of tissue on the back of the eye that, that transduces the photons into electrical signals, goes across the optic nerve to the brain. Now, the brain is a massively parallel computer made up of 100 billion elements in humans. And each neuron, so each, each computational element, is actually a computer unto itself. So it takes inputs in, and it puts outputs out. Uh, over some ten, uh, some hundred trillion connections between these neurons. Now, we know something, it's not just diffusely organized, it's actually a very interesting structure to the visual system. It's arranged hierarchically. So information comes into the back of the brain into an area called V1, and then successively information is sent to way stations where it's processed and transformed. And these areas are called V1 for visual area 1, V2, V4, don't worry about where V3 went. And then there's an area called TE, which is the temporal cortex. And there are actually quite a few more visual areas. It turns out that in vision, there's a segregation between our processing of what something is and our processing of where it is and how fast it's moving and things like that. So uh, some of the other V numbers uh, correspond to that other stream of processing. So it's interesting what happens. If you, if you record from the neurons in these areas and measure their activity, you find that Neurons in area V1 are primarily concerned with small, simple structures, like little edges. And then if we go up to the highest levels in area TE, also called area IT, we find really interesting neurons. So here's a, a figure from the 1980s from Robert Desimone. And what he did was he showed a monkey with an electrode in its brain in this area images of face and an image, uh, images of scrambled faces. So they have comparable complexity, uh, visually, roughly speaking, but this one forms together to form a face, and that one does not. 
And what you see above is the firing of the neuron in the brain. So you don't need to worry too much about what, the, what this means, other than up means more firing, and that way means forward in time. And this little bracket shows you when the stimulus was up. So you, without you know, thinking too hard about it, you can clearly see that this neuron seems to like faces. It fires when you see faces. And this is actually quite magical when you have a, an electrode uh, recording from a neuron and you're showing stimuli and figuring out what the cell fires in response to. But it's, it's probably a little bit more complex than just saying that this is a face neuron. But at the same time, it's reasonable to say that this neuron represents, uh, represents the face. So then we take all this information, and then what my lab and other labs do is trying to take inspiration from the natural system, and what we can glean and what we know about the natural system, and then build an artificial system that shares the same structure and shares uh, aspects of the same processing. And where the natural brain is made up of billions of neurons, the artificial system is built up of artificial neurons that are basically functions. So what we need to do is study the system, figure out how to build versions like that. And then we can deploy these in a variety of contexts. My lab uses these for face recognition, face detection. We also use them for robot navigation um, and a variety of other different tasks. So the problem is that the processing power of the brain is actually quite a bit more than the processing power of a computer. So it's at least, uh, at least petaflops of computational power in the brain, which is remarkable also considering that it only dissipates somewhere between 15 and 20 watts. So it's using about as much power as your laptop, and yet it's as powerful computationally as some of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. So that's uh, an interesting fact in and of itself. Now, in the meantime, before we, you know, eventually we'll figure out how to, how to get that power efficiency, but in the meantime, what we do is we build up large clusters. We use lots of computers to try and mimic the power or, or the abilities of a brain. And we'll worry about the power later. We'll figure out, uh, and this is one, again, one of the great things about computer science is you can divorce the algorithm from the implementation. We can figure out how to implement it efficiently later. And you may have heard uh, stories about how uh, there was a group associated with IBM that claimed that they had assembled enough computational power to simulate the brain of a cat. Uh, this was big news about five years ago. Um, and it, it's a bit of a curious claim, uh, but it's an illustrative one. So it's, it's sort of like saying you took aluminum and bolts and put them together and you got an airplane. Uh, I, I don't particularly want to fly on an airplane uh, if somebody just told me I've assembled enough aluminum and enough bolts to build an airplane, I'd actually like to see that plane fly. So in the case of this cat, if it's not chasing mice and catching mice, uh, our, our job sort of isn't done. And this is really the hard part. So you'll find people claiming that they've built these supercomputers and we can finally simulate brains. The question is, what does that brain do? And does that brain actually do the important things and the interesting things that brains can do? Or does it just have uh, sort of a, a virtual uh, seizure. And there's actually a huge uh, European Union project, uh, multi-billion euro project, uh, aimed at simulating a huge brain, but not necessarily with, with a whole lot of emphasis on what the, what the brain's going to do. And there's differences of opinion about whether that's a good idea. So this is actually an incredibly uh, ripe time to be, to be in this area. So it turns out we've been studying these, these artificial brain-like systems, they're called artificial neural networks, for a very long time. In fact, in the 40s, uh, the first neural network ideas uh, sort of were born. In the 80s, they became a, a big thing. And then in the 90s, they hadn't quite delivered yet, so the whole thing collapsed, and there was something called the AI winter. But today, uh, is actually a really sweet time to be in this business because uh, the systems have gotten pretty good. And you might have heard stories like these. So um, Google just bought a company called DeepMind for half a billion dollars. And that was entirely based on this technology of building brain-inspired computational systems. And meanwhile, Google and Baidu and Twitter and Facebook are basically hiring up a huge fraction of the field. Actually, Mark Zuckerberg showed up this past year at uh, one of our field's major conferences and basically hired everyone in sight. Uh, so so it, the, the, there's, there are people at Google now who are, who are claiming uh, sort of back of the envelope that perhaps 10% of the best people in the field now work for uh, these companies. So it's, it's an unprecedented privatization uh, of an entire academic field. And um, 
at some level, that, that's at least an indication that, that some of the smart money, at least, is, is thinks that there's some 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 gas here. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that this wasn't really driven by some conceptual advance that happened. It's much more driven by computational power and the availability of big data. So uh, Google and YouTube alone collects hundreds of hours of video per minute. So that's just a huge, huge amount of data. And they have the computational resources. They have the server farms to run it. And in many ways, the systems that are now available that Google's getting so excited about buying and that are winning a lot of these academic benchmarks and challenges uh, over in the academic field, what's changed isn't so much that we've understood something new about the brain. A lot of our insights were from, from the 80s. Uh, but what's changed is now we have huge amounts of data. But at the same time, a lot of the tasks that we'd like to solve, like the Boston Marathon bombing, like that complex street scene, we still aren't able to do. We aren't able to do them just with lots and lots of data and just with lots and lots of compute power. We need more information. We need more clues about how the system is organized. So fortunately, uh, there's sort of two huge tidal waves that are on a collision course with one another. So on one hand, we have all this data, and we have an unprecedented amount of compute power, and we have some real traction where we're starting to get useful applications coming out of these computer algorithms. But on the other hand, neuroscience is going through an absolute revolution in new tools and techniques. Um, and my lab uh, is a bit unusual in that we try and actually do both. So in addition to building computer algorithms of the sort that, uh, that Google's interested in, we also want to go into the brain and look for clues about what we should build next and get data that we can use to constrain the algorithms that we build. So this uh, is roughly speaking how we uh, reverse engineer a brain. So you imagine if you had a competing product uh, that another, one of your competing companies produced and you didn't know how it worked, but you really wanted to know how it worked, you might buy the product open it up. I mean, there are laws against that in some places, but you might do it anyway. You open it up, you put some, some, uh, some oscilloscope probes in, and you try and figure out how it works. You reverse engineer the system. And roughly speaking, we can do the exact same thing with nature. It just so happens that instead of being a competing product, it's actually uh, usually a warm-blooded furry creature so, uh, or a human. Uh, so what we have here are some of the, the, this is pretty much the earliest technology for reverse engineering the brain. This is a tungsten microelectrode. So this is basically a wire that you can hook up to an amplifier. These are two neurons. And this gets down to about 20 microns, or 20 thousandths of a millimeter uh, at the very tip. And then uh, traditionally what you do is you go and you park an electrode next to a neuron, and you listen to it. You literally put the amplifier to a, uh, to a speaker and you can listen to the cell. And the way cells communicate with each other is by something called action potentials, or spikes. And they're little popping noises. So you can actually hear, uh, you know, as you stimulate the cell or you show a, an image, you can hear a little tack, 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 tack of the cell firing. And that's what this lets you do. Now, what's exciting is that uh, through all kinds of innovations in other industries, we've now increasingly have access to much better versions of this technology. So this is a kind of electrode array that we use in my laboratory. This is a silicon micro-machined electrode array. So it's got an array. You can see there's these little dots, our iridium uh, electrode recording pads. So it's sort of like one of those, except now we can have uh, dozens or hundreds of them. And then this basically sticks into the brain, and we can wiretap a much larger number. And then this is something new that we're developing uh, or starting to use in my lab. Uh, these are carbon, uh, carbon microwires. So these are each five microns in diameter, or about a twentieth of the width of a human hair. We can get huge numbers of these now into brains. We can snake them in. And then because they're so flexible, they're actually almost impossible to see with the naked eye because they're so small. Uh, they can kind of float in the brain. The brain's always pulsing because there's uh, blood flowing through it. Uh, but these guys can sort of float in the brain, and then we can get isolations for a very long period of time. Now, these are the old school technologies, frankly. This is sort of the, 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 that was the updated version of old technologies. But there's actually quite a bit of, quite a number of new, exciting technologies that are also available. So this picture uh, was, I just learned was taken by Feng Zhang, who just gave the last Betazone presentation. I, I stole it without knowing it was his. And, and uh, anyway, thanks, Feng. Uh, so this is uh, an example of optogenetics. So what this is, is uh, particularly two researchers, Carl Dizeroth and Ed Boyden, 
at Stanford and MIT respectively, uh, developed a way to introduce uh, ion channels, proteins from other species, and in some cases engineered version of those proteins from other species, into neurons. And then what this lets you do is it lets you shine light on the cells and then you can either turn them on or turn them off. So it's a little bit like installing an on-off switch in neurons. And because these are targeted with genetic technologies, you can target specific kinds of cells. There's different cell types in the brain. So we can you know, give certain cells a kick. We can turn off certain cells. We can start to manipulate the circuit. So again, this is if we're reverse engineering a brain, these are the kinds of things you want to be able to do. You want to be able to selectively probe different parts of the circuit and see what happens. Um, in addition, we also have uh, new optical technologies for recording the activity. So I showed you the old school thing, which was putting an electrode in and measuring the electrical potentials near the cell. But there's actually quite a few new technologies. So this is a picture of, of an instrument in, in my lab. It's called a two-photon excitation microscope. And what we do, uh, so the rat, roughly speaking, would, would go right here. And this is a little wheel he can run on. And then this is a powerful laser that we shine into his brain. And what the reason shining a laser into the brain works in this case and lets us see activity is because we've also introduced a genetically encoded calcium indicator. So when cells fire, calcium rushes into the cell, and then these genetically encoded fluorophores will light up when, when, when the, the cell is active. So if you look here, you just saw there was a cell that's sort of glowing. You're watching right now a series of cells. Each one of these round bodies is a cell in the rat's visual cortex. And as it lights up and, and gets dimmer, you're watching the activity of the cell. So when the cell fires, it gets brighter. And we can use this technology to record from hundreds of cells. And critically, we can record from those same cells over long periods of time. So you can imagine learning not just how the, the brain works sort of in its final steady state, but you can also start to study how the brain changes over time. And this is the kind of thing that when we're building machine learning technologies, we really like to see them, the learning uh, in action. And then there are other exciting technologies. So this is uh, something that's happening just down the hall for me. So this is Bobby Casturi and his advisor, Jeff Lickman. Um, and what we see here is an electron micrograph of a brain. So what we can do is we can take uh, the brain that I just showed you where we're watching the activity, we can take the brain out. Uh, so this is one thing that's not great to do in humans, but you can do it in rats. Um, and we take the brain out, and we've imaged those cells so we know what their activity was like. But then we can actually slice with a very fine knife uh, the brain, and we can look at the very fine structures of, of, of the tissue. So this is an example of one image, but it's actually part of a large volume of tissue that's imaged this way. And the reason you need to use an electron microscope is because these features are actually too small to image with light. So the wavelength of light would actually be something like this. So it's just light is too big to interact with how small these things are. But with an electron microscope, we can slice and reconstruct, and then we can trace the wiring. So we can literally get the wiring diagram from the very same cells that we were just imaging to get their activity. And this is an incredibly powerful technique. That, uh, that Jeff Lickman has largely pioneered and that we're joining forces to, to use. And here's an example of a uh, uh, single uh, cell's dendrite, which is the input process, and then all of the uh, other processes connecting onto it. So I told you there were 100 trillion connections. These are the connections to just one of those neurons in one place. And you can see this incredible complexity of different, uh, different kinds of stuff that are connected. And really, this technology is game changing because it means that we can uh, know everything about how the brain is hooked up. We can segregate out uh, different kinds of processes, axons, which are the outputs, dendrites, which are the inputs, also uh, a number of different things uh, like glial cells that are supporting cells. Uh, there's unidentified stuff, which I'm fascinated by, but. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, so it's really an amazing time to be thinking about uh, neuroscience and thinking about how this all fits together. So um, the other thing I should mention, I, 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 a lot of people want to, uh, want to see this work being done in humans, and I think this is actually a mistake. So I mentioned that we were doing this in rats, and there really is a huge advantage to that. So 
uh, imagine you were an alien coming to Earth, and you didn't know anything about what cars were. You saw these things moving around, but you weren't quite sure what they were. Uh, the, a sensible thing to do would be to get a car and take it apart and try and figure out how it works. Now, you could choose my car, so I took a picture of the inside of my car. This is a 2007 Prius. It's a pretty good car. Uh, it's a complicated car. It's got a uh, very complicated powertrain. It's got a motor and an engine. It's got uh, 13 computers on board, computer-controlled fuel injection. Uh, it's a great car. It's a, a marvel of engineering. But if I was trying to study cars, uh, it might not actually be the right car for me to start with. I might prefer to start with the car I learned to drive on, which is a 1980 Ford Pinto. Uh, that's a terrible car. It's not a good car at all. But it's got a carburetor, it's got big parts, it's got spark plugs. Um, it's a, it, just because it's a less good system, uh, it, it might be less good at what it does, it's actually a better system to start with. So this is sort of the training wheels for understanding. And, and what I'm going to argue is that uh, you know, it, it, there is a drive uh, to, to study in humans, because we're humans and we need to study the neuroscience of humans, but really we're not at that stage yet. We're not quite there yet. So what, we, what we're going to do instead is we're going to find the Ford Pinto of nature, uh, which is the rat. And uh, actually, calling a rat a Ford Pinto is totally not fair, because they don't explode. And, uh, and they're actually quite wonderful at what they do. Uh, nearly every organism on Earth is wonderful at what it does. And if it weren't wonderful at what it does, it would be replaced by some other creature that could do what it needed to do better. But it's true that, that their brains are much simpler. Again, this idea that this complexity is what makes us different, like now we need to dial that back. We need to look at something that's, that's simpler. And in sheer numbers, uh, the numbers of neurons are much, much smaller, uh, where the brain is sort of two pounds of stuff in our head. A rat's brain is about this big. So when we do things like connectomics or we do imaging, we can actually start to make some traction. Um, and this is just to show you what, uh, what my lab looks like. So because we're studying neuroscience, which is really the biology of behavior, we've built all these rigs um, to control the behavior. So basically what I'm telling you is I have a, an army of trained rats uh, that live in my lab, and these are the rigs we train them in. So it's basically uh, a series of high throughput boxes. We can take the animals, we can put them in. They basically play little video games. Uh, and then we teach them to do stuff so that when then we go and measure their activity in their brain or we measure changes in the activity of their brain, we can do that with respect to an actual thing that the animal is doing. And this is just to give you a sense of what this looks like. So here we're showing, this is a monitor where we're showing the, the animal different objects because we're interested in object recognition. This is a rat down here, so you can see uh, there he is with his whiskers and he's licking. And this is basically, this is basically PlayStation for, for rats. Uh, this is about as good as it gets. Um, so he's just touching these little sensors, these little capacitive sensors, and then they, they put out little bits of juice. And what this lets us do is to have a very fine control over the behavior in a very high throughput way. And we can mix this with all these technologies and bundle this all up, try and build, uh, he's adorable, isn't he? Um, build up an understanding of, of how his brain works. He just got one wrong. Um, so this is really, uh, this is an amazing time to, to put all this stuff together. Um, and we're actually uh, starting to assemble a team. And this is, a, this is an enormous undertaking. So the connectomics alone, if we were to take a millimeter cubed of tissue and slice it up and try and image it, that's one and a half petabytes of data. So an enormous quantity of data. Uh, to record from all those neurons, enormous quantity of data, an enormous undertaking, bringing all together all the machine learning uh, expertise that we need to bring together. So what we're doing now is we're assembling a team across Harvard and MIT and a few other institutions, basically to do a very serious take on this reverse engineering of the brain, uh, partly driven by interest now from the government, so the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Administration, which is basically the, the intelligence version of DARPA, which you may have heard of, is now uh, putting out a challenge for groups like ours to assemble and really take seriously this idea that we can take all of these technologies, which are, which are right on the cusp, go to the very frontier of what we're able to do with them, put all that information together and really make a front on push. And we're gonna, this is not an easy task for us to, to undertake. It's gonna take money, it's gonna take, uh, it's going to take academic cooperation. It's also gonna take private cooperation. We're increasingly working with Google now because Google is one of the only uh, entities in the world that can deal with this much data, uh, and we're collaborating with them now. And we're going to have to bring that all together uh, to make this push, but this sense that, uh, that this really is the sort of the, the key, the crux of our humanity, even if we're studying it in, in, in rodents, uh, 
it, it really makes it sort of the, one of the greatest challenges of our time, sort of to, to go to the frontier and see if we can figure out how these brain systems work and then figure out if we can build them ourselves. So with that, I will close. Thank you.